chapter 3, verse number 9 says, Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. Wow. I read this in a commentary. about I, If I find a commentary and it has 1 John, I go to it immediately and I just I read through it. Um, I found this in a commentary. If you don't hate sin and love holiness, you are not born of God. Ooh. Wow. Well, I think a good bit of the time I hate sin and love holiness, but I know there are times when I don't. Man, pretty powerful stuff, isn't it? And that was from this book of 1 John. That was a theologian's comments from the, from the book of 1 John. Um, I've, we've heard this. Um, if he's not Lord of all, then he's not Lord at all. Wow. Now, I would categorically disagree with those statements, especially if you get them from the book of 1 John. Is that what John is trying to teach us? Is that the purpose of this epistle of 1 John? I want you to notice, first off, um, my wife tells me I shouldn't deal with this, but I think I need to because it's just important to understanding the context. There was a fundamental issue of false teaching that was prevalent during this time that this book was initially written, that this letter was initially written, and it was a false teaching known as Gnosticism, G-N-O-S-T-I-C-I-S-M. Thank you. I never did well in a spelling bee, um, but um, Gnosticism. And it was an issue. Matter of fact, you, you, you look at any historical context of the book of 1 John, you will find Gnosticism was an issue. It's still a part uh, of many religions today in Far Eastern countries, Gnosticism is. Gnosticism is and uh, fundamentally, it's a religion of the intellectuals. Maybe that's why it's not very appealing to me, uh, but it's a religion given to intellectual people. And let me just explain it in a nutshell. A Gnostic believed a couple things. Number one, a Gnostic believed that your flesh was bad. Your flesh held captive this um, almost perf perfectness that was in each and every one of us, this, this spark of divinity, if I could call it that. And it was held captive by your flesh. It was trying to blossom. It was trying to... Um, to, to come out of its shell, so to speak, but your flesh held it captive. And a Gnostic also elevated experience for this reason. The more you knew, the better you were. So knowledge was elevated, and the best way to gain knowledge was through experience. It kind of makes sense. It's, there's some logic to it. For example, if you want to know about something, go ahead and try it. All right. Um, what's it like to drive 150 miles an hour down uh, Commercial Boulevard? Well, just get out there and try it. I mean, I wouldn't do that, but if you want to know, go ahead, you know. Um, and what a Gnostic then would do is they would try anything. It didn't matter if it was good or bad. M morals were beside the point. Why? Because you could try it. You could learn in the process and you would gain knowledge. Well, we have to understand that that's not good thinking. If something's bad, don't be a part of it, okay? Period. You don't need to try it just to, to find out whether it's good or bad, all right? Um, and so that was the, the, um, the, the prevalent false teaching that was going around. Matter of fact, that's why the book, in my opinion, begins the way it does. Look at verse number one. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life. Who is verse 1? And if you want to be fair, go through to verse 2. Who are verse 1 and verse 2 talking about? Believers. Jesus Christ. Okay. Now, when it says we saw him, we heard him, we touched him, what are they talking about? They're talking about the incarnate Christ. They're talking about God in the Flesh. Ooh, a Gnostic wouldn't believe that. You're kidding me. No way. God would not send his son in the flesh. Flesh is bad. But John begins by saying, look, we saw him, we heard him, we touched him. He was the word of life. That reference is John chapter 1. And Jesus Christ is God. Jesus Christ, that is, God did come in the flesh. 
dealing, I think, primarily with this issue of Gnosticism. Well, it appears that Christians were beginning to embrace this false teaching. Sounds a little appealing, doesn't it? Do whatever. Try it. It's not bad if you can learn something. And so Christians were embracing this. And do you know false teaching always undermines sound doctrine? It always does. That's why it's, it's important to not stray into false teaching. And especially this lifestyle stuff. Okay? Do you know how you live is important? And one of the fundamental doctrines that is undermined from living worldly is a doctrine we call assurance of salvation. Um, 2 Peter chapter 1 deals with this. We're not going to look at it, but it talks about adding things to your faith. And the Bible says, when these things are missing, you'll become blind and cannot see afar off and will have forgotten that you were purged from your old sins. So that how you live really is important. And so, if I understand it, when we get into chapter 2 and so forth, it appears that the doctrine of assurance was being undermined. And these things write we unto you that your joy may be full. Okay, we learned something from verse 4, and we learned that one of the reasons for the writing of the book of 1 John is so that our joy can be full. Um, God wants us to know joy in our life. Isn't that a good thought? Some people think, boy, if you're a Christian, life has to be, you know, just ho-hum, doom and gloom and miserable and just kind of plot along and just, you know, carry your cross and someday on the other side of eternity, you'll have true joy and happiness. I don't believe that. I think you can have joy right now, right where you're at as God's child. That's right. And so one of the reasons for the writing is so that our joy may be full. The word full means crammed or complete. Not a little joy, but a lot of joy. God wants us to have a joy that is full in our life. So it brings me to an obvious question. Are you experiencing joy as a child of God? Some of you look at me like a calf at a new gate. Hmm? Where did he come from? <laughs> Are you experiencing joy as a child of God? Is that a fair question? I think it is in light of this. Um, you know, this incorrect teaching from the book of 1 John, it doesn't bring joy to our life. Trying to undermine um, our salvation, there's no joy in that. There's confusion and turmoil. The Bible tells us in Psalm 16, verse 11, Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. Okay, so you can have joy in your life as God's child, but the fact of the matter is many times we don't, right? Sure, that's just right down where we're at, where we live. Many times we don't have joy. Well, what robs us of joy in our life? Sin does. Do you remember Psalm 51, David's psalm of confession with Bathsheba, the sins he had committed? And he says in verse number 8, make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Verse 12, he says, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. So there's no doubt about it. Sin will rob you of joy in your life. Look, for a good many Christians, unfortunately, we know more about sin than we do joy. So here's... Here's in part what we've learned from the book of 1 John thus far. God wants us to have joy in our life. That's a good thing. It really is. For you, whoever you are, whatever your name is, if you're a believer, if you're a child of God, God wants you in your life to experience joy. And that encourages me to know that that's what God wants for me. And so if God wants that for me, I'm going to be naive enough to think it's possible. How about you? Amen. Sure it is. Okay. So God is interested in us having a joy, and not just any joy, but a joy that is full. Now, it brings us to verse 5. Listen to verse 5. This, then, is the message. Will you listen to how that's worded? It's the very beginning of the book. 
We're five, chapter, five verses deep, okay? So not very far in. And listen 